I want to start this message up with just a very, very true story. Um, when I lived in New England, there was a sister at our church who was a very sweet lady. And she, I believe, loved the Lord as best as she knew how, at least. And uh, it was amazing because it was January of 2018. And, you know, New Year's, you always give testimonies. You talk about the goodness of God. And I remember this sister. She stood up in the testimonial time. And she said, I want to thank the Lord that I am healthy and I'm strong and I'm doing great. Those were her words. She was at 69 years young at that time. And she said, I want to thank the Lord. I feel healthy, I feel strong, and I feel great. That was in January. Then my family, family and I went to Bermuda, and we went to go do a mission in Bermuda. And I remember my phone rang while I was there. And when it went off, I looked at it, and it said, pray for Lola. That was the same lady who gave her testimony in January. And it said, pray for her. And so, of course, being a member of the church, and I was working there as uh, the pastor or the associate pastor at that time. So I said, what's going on? And, you know, I wanted to inquire. And when I inquired, they said, she's in the hospital. Some serious crisis took place. Didn't get the details yet. So then next thing you know, when we got back home, I got the details. It turned out that she had a mass inside of her colon. And then she had about four lesions on her liver. She had stage four cancer. January... I feel great. May, pray for Lola, stage four cancer. December, I believe it was December 18, Lola breathed her last breath. And I thought to myself, I said, isn't that something? January, I praise the Lord, I feel great. December, she breathed her last breath. When we had the privilege of ministering to our sister, I remember one of the first questions, because I was the one functioning as the chaplain for her. So I remember that my job was to, 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 you know, give her the spiritual preparation she needed so that she could go through this very serious journey. And I remember that as I was talking with her, one of the first things I asked her, I said, is there anybody in your life that you have not forgiven? I asked her that question. I said, is there any battle with forgiveness or unforgiveness in your heart? And she thought about it, and she said, well, no, no, I, I, I think I'm okay. And, you know, I remember she said that clear as day. And I said, all right. I said, are you sure now? Yes, I'm sure. I said, okay. I said, let me tell you why. And I, I began to take her to Scripture, and I showed her how God can heal. I mean, listen, I, I have learned, I'm a living witness that God gets the last say. I'm a living witness of that. In 2016, I had heart surgery because as a child, I had rheumatic fever. And when you get rheumatic fever, which is pretty rare in the U.S., but nevertheless, I got it. And when I got it, the bacteria can damage your mitral valve of your heart. Decades goes by, and it turns out that my mitral valve was so bad that I needed surgery. So I had to get surgery done. And I remember that when I, when I had to get the surgery... Everybody kept saying, well, you're only 44 years old. That's in 2016. They said, you're 44 years young. You need to get a mechanical valve. But they said, but if we put a mechanical valve in you, you're going to be on blood thinners for the rest of your life. So I didn't want that. And I said, is there any way that the valve could be repaired? That's the best option. They said, well, your valve is pretty badly diseased. And here it is that I found a surgeon that said, I think I can repair your valve. But we went to one of the top cardiologists at a prestigious uh, uh, hospital in Loma Linda. And we went there, and a top cardiologist looked at my valve and said, your valve is irreparable. He's like, I look at thousands of valves, et cetera, et cetera. He said, your valve is irreparable. He wrote it on the paper, valve irreparable. I'm still trying to understand why is it that it's going on eight years since that surgery, and I stand before you with a repaired valve. God gets the last say. Mankind in his, watch my words, limited expertise will say what he has to say. But God is the creator and the owner of the body and the restorer of the body. He gets the last say. So even when our dear Lola was stage four and destined for death, we said, uh-uh. We said, God gets the last say. 
If you must die, that's okay as long as it's God's will. But if God's will is for you to live, then you need to live. And if you want to live, God is very clear. If you do not forgive, you cannot be forgiven. So that's why I started the council off with, is there any unforgiveness in your heart? Because when we go to God, we want God to hear us. But if we regard iniquity, which includes unforgiveness, in our hearts, Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, the Lord will not hear us. So here it is, my dear sister said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm good. So we go through the procedures, and man, she, she, she had a great program. She had a pro- In fact, her body was responding very well at different times to the program. She was doing amazing. But we kept noticing some problems. And the long story short is, when she started to reach the end of her life, I was with her an hour before she died. I remember that it was an hour before she died that that was the first time she really dealt with unforgiveness. All throughout her treatment, unforgiveness was actually buried deep inside. I walked away from that understanding that when we deal with this subject of forgiveness, it, it's, it's such an important subject. This is the subject of subjects because, you know, you all just finished, for those of you who are part of this church, you, you just finished going through a Sabbath school and, and you studied about the, the cleansing of the sanctuary and the most holy place and, and all these wonderful things, wonderful things. And these things are real. There's a real sanctuary in heaven with a real high priest named Jesus, and there's a real cleansing work that he's doing right now. And his desire is to do the positive C versus the negative C. You see, there are two C's that happens during the Day of Atonement. Depending on where you're reading in your Bible, if you're reading Leviticus 23, verses 27 to 29, let's turn our Bibles there. I want you to see what it says. In Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, we'll look at the first C. In Leviticus, we're considering the 23rd chapter. I want you to see what the Bible says in verse 27. Let's discover the first C that can take place on the Day of Atonement. The Bible says in Luke chapter, sorry, Leviticus chapter 23, and we're considering verse 27. If you're there, just let me know by saying amen. One day somebody said, how can you prove that the Day of Atonement is a day of judgment? I said, well, that's easy. I said, it's right here. The Bible says in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, starting at verse 27, it says, also on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of what? All right. A day of atonement. Now watch. It says, it shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls. You shall offer an offering made by fire. Verse 28. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now watch carefully. Verses 29 and 30. It says in verse 29, for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be, what are those two words? Cut off. Cut off from among his people. What exactly does God mean when he says cut off? Next verse. The next verse says, and whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I what? destroy from among his people. To be cut off from God is to ultimately be destroyed by God. Very, very bad, right? So that's one C that we see that happens on the Day of Atonement. People are going to get cut off. Ah, but what's the positive C? Let's go to Leviticus 16. In Leviticus 16, we see a positive C. This is the C I, I would imagine all you reasonable, sensible people want. It says in Leviticus 16, let's go ahead and consider verse 30 now. In Leviticus, the 16th chapter, and we're considering the 30th verse, let us see what happens on the Day of Atonement as well. It says in Leviticus 16, verse 30, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to do what to you? To cleanse you that you may be what? Clean from how much? All your sins before the Lord. That's the positive C. 
The day of atonement is a day of, of judgment. Why? Because everybody is going to fall under one of the two seas. Either they're going to be cut off or they're going to be cleansed. And I don't know about you, but my desire is to be counted amongst the cleanse group and not the cut off group. If you're with me, let me hear you say amen. amen. Now check this out. This is very simple, family. If your desire is to be counted amongst the cleansed and the cut off, then we must deal with this subject of unforgiveness. Because I think there's a lot of us that battle with this. There are people, there are groups of people that have done some things to us that was wrong, evil, foul, atrocious, terrible, audacious. And we think to ourselves, sometimes these folks did it, and to date, they did not apologize. To date, they didn't even show that they're sorry. And there's a little piece of our heart that says, I'm a Christian, so I'll say it like this. I'll forgive you, but I ain't going to never forget what you did. <laughs> Is that right? Now, can I show you something elementary? Let me just show you something. I just want to deal with this stuff. I want to deal with this right now because I believe with all of my heart, there is power from God that is present right now, ready to heal some of us. But it's going to be very, very important that you and I position ourselves to receive the healing. The doctors of the law literally had the power of the Lord present to heal them, but they didn't get healed. It wasn't because the power wasn't there. The Bible just said the power was there. But they were not in the position to receive the healing. And so the curse continues. I want you to go to, with me to the book of Luke, the 11th chapter. I want you to see something. I'm going to show you something that's very elementary. Very, very elementary. Kind of like, yep, I, I know that. I want you to see what the Bible says. We're going to Luke, the 11th chapter. Jesus was uh, having some prayer time. And as he's having some prayer time, you know, the disciples happened to come in on him while he's having his prayer time. So the disciples didn't want to disrupt him while he's praying. They wanted to be respectful, but they could not help to hear what Jesus was doing. You see, contrary to what some people think, the Jews prayed aloud. They didn't do this kind of prayer. They did a prayer where it was audible. You could hear it. And so it is that Jesus was praying aloud. And so the disciples are hearing Jesus' prayer. And as they hear Jesus pray, look at what verse 1 says. It says, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, you see the disciples are respectful. They knew, let me not talk to him while he's praying. Let's wait till he stops. So it says, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, Teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Verse 2, and he said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Now, here we go. Here we go. It's right here. Verse 4. It says, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us as well. In other words, forgive us of our sins as we forgive our debtors. So let me go back to something I said just a couple of minutes ago. When you say, I forgive you, but I ain't never going to forget. Do you understand you just gave Jesus license to say, dear child, I forgive you, but I'm never going to forget what you did. Now, please keep in mind, God can't forget. He's God. But God makes a choice of what he does with the remembrance of whatever it is that comes up in his mind. 
In other words, family, let's keep it real, real, because I can work with people that can keep it real. I can't work with fakes too well, but I can work with real people very well. Let's keep it real. What do you mean? I hear your words, but you ever heard somebody say something, but they mean more than what they're saying? You ever heard that before? You ever talked to somebody like that? They say something, and it's like, I'm hearing your words, but I'm hearing something more than just your words. You ever had a conversation with somebody like that? I know a lot of you have. What do you really mean when you say, I forgive you, but I'm never going to forget? What do you mean by that? Because I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's an issue that you don't forget something that happened to you. I don't think that's an issue. But I got a feeling we mean more than just merely stating a fact that we're never going to forget. So I wonder if there's just a couple of people. Like, you know, this is, this is conversational, all right? This is, a, this is a conversational sermon. Talk to me. What, what do you think you mean or people mean? When they say, I forgive you, but I'm never going to forget what you did. What, what do you think the person's actually trying to communicate? Say again. I never really forgave you. Okay, that's deep, right? Okay, that's good. I, I appreciate these honest answers, for real. Thank you for that, family. Yes. Okay, I forgive you, but I'm going to be cautious around you in the future, or cautious about you in the future. I like that, Brother Nicholas. My sister in the back, go ahead. I think in the context, I don't think, in reality, if you think about it, you never actually forget. I agree. The, the whatever hurt you go through in life, right? Because I could say you, you hurt me, right? I can say I forgive you, but actually with that pain, you're still there. Sometimes you have to go through, like, me, because, like, I've been hurt in the past, right? Sure. Okay, I appreciate that. So, you know, I can forgive you, but the pain, the sc- what you did to me, it's leaving a scar. And it's going to take some time for this to heal. All right? That's legit. Totally get it. Take a couple more hands. Yes. That could be physically, mentally, or emotionally what? Okay, okay, so that scar again. Yes, brother. That's our whole study today. No, 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 this is good. This is good because that's honest, right? Sometimes it's like, you know, I'm using a word that I'm not sure I really understand fully. What does this word mean? Forgiveness, right? That's the whole purpose of this study. So by God's grace, at the conclusion, we're really going to say amen because we're going to get it. Yes. Yes, my brother, you had your hand up. You hurt me and I'm still wounded. All right, that's fair. Yes. I forgive you, but I won't trust you, right? Okay, yes? I forgive you, I choose not to let go. I forgive you, I choose not to let go. Okay. Yes, sis, this will be the last one, okay? Go ahead. You forgive, but each time you say the first thing, how can you forget? Right. That's true. This, this is why there's a mixture of logic and common sense, and then there's a part that's really not good, Okay. The logic, common sense side of it is, every time I see you, of course I'm going to remember. Do you remember in Psalm 51 when David confesses his sin to God and then he says, my sin is ever before me? David could never look at Bathsheba and forget how he got Bathsheba. You understand that? There's no way. If Bathsheba has an offspring, every time he sees the offspring, he's going to remember how he got with the mother that ultimately produced the offspring, right? And we know that it was very negative how David got with Bathsheba. So there's no question that when you see them, it's going to trigger a memory. The real test is not remembering that something happened, because it happened. But the real test is what do we do with that memory? What do we do with it? You see, before we go into what forgiveness is, let's talk about what forgiveness is not, okay? Let's do that first, and then we'll go ahead and go into it, because I really believe that the power of God is present to heal. I am amazed at how many people, I'm going to make this very quick point, and then we're going to go into the message, um, 
to the slides. I went to a camp meeting. It was in 2010. It was a powerful camp meeting. I mean, it was a camp meeting where you had the heavy hitters there. I mean, people who taught very powerful Bible, very powerful spirit of prophecy, end time events, the whole nine yards. It was very, very powerful. And I've been going to these camp meetings since 2006. Now it's 2010. 2010 comes along and all of the speakers are there. Hundreds of people are coming and we're all believers in present truth. We believe the end time message. We believe the three angels. We believe time is almost finished. We believe the message. Well, here it is that there was a different speaker that year that was added to the rostrum. His name was Thomas Jackson, tall man. I knew him at that time. I knew him for seven years, but I didn't really like know him. I knew him. I was acquainted with him, but I didn't really like know him, know him yet. So he's one of the speakers there. So all these other brothers are coming in. They're talking about we're going to talk about end time events and the nearness of the final crisis. We're going to talk about the nearness of the mark of the beast. We're going to talk about the problems in the church. We're going to talk about all this stuff. And boy, the whole church was like, amen. We are excited. We're about to get deep. That's what we felt. When Thomas Jackson's turn came, he said, I'm going to talk about forgiveness. We were like, what? It's like it didn't it didn't blend. It's like you got these deep warrior subjects and then you got this light, fluffy subject about forgiveness. I was like, man, we already know about forgiveness. Tell us about the beast power. Tell me about the nearness of the Sunday law. You know, talk to me about the deep stuff, bro. Don't don't give me this. Forgiveness, you know, forgiveness is for the elementary. The kids are at home. We grown-ups. You know, teach me the deep stuff. So anyhow, I decided, well, I'm going to go ahead and listen because I'm here. So I'm listening, and he's giving his whole message on forgiveness. And I remember I'm sitting there like, that was a good point. Oh, wow, that was another good point. Ooh, I never thought about that one. And so he's really getting my attention as he's going through this thing. But here's the part that got me the most. Really good sermon, powerful message on forgiveness. But here was the part that got me. I lied to you that 2010 was what I believe the beginning of a wake-up call in my life personally. When Brother Jackson was finishing up his sermon, he got to the time of the appeal. He talked about his father who left him, had to grow up with a single home, single mother home and all of that. He talked about that, the bitterness in his heart. And then he talked about how he found his father and went to his father, knocked on his door. Are you Mr. So-and-so and all of that? And basically let him know, I forgive you for abandoning me. He did the whole trip just to let him know, I forgive you for abandoning me. So Brother Jackson then gives this appeal. He says, if there's any of you that have been harboring unforgiveness in your heart, And before he could finish the appeal, a guy that I knew who was a present truth believer just like me, he got up out of his seat, ran up on that pulpit, and he literally like fell on Brother Jackson's chest and started crying. Grown man, and I add, grown black man. I say that because there's a little thing called black pride where sometimes brothers are scared to show their emotion. That's not cool. You know what I mean? He lost all of that. He was like, nope, I'm broken. And he literally fell on his chest and started crying. So I was like, oh, wow. Next thing you know, another black guy gets up and another guy gets up and another guy gets up. And before you know it, there was like 50 brothers on top of this big, big pulpit. And they're all holding each other and they're all crying. And for the first time in their lives, they let God take away their unforgiveness. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, I said, every year we talked about the nearness of the Sunday law. Every year we talked about the apostasies in the church. Every year we talked about the sanctuary and all of what Christ is doing. We talked about deep stuff and All those years, these brothers was in a lost condition because every year while they heard all this deep stuff, they still had unforgiveness in their hearts. And that is when I said, okay, 
there's something a lot of us are missing when we talk about this thing called present truth. And it put me on a journey. And here I am even today. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to let you know it is imperative that whatever unforgiveness you got in your heart towards that relative, towards that man, towards that woman, towards that ex-spouse, towards whoever it is that hurt you and damaged you and did you wrong. If you're still letting them live in your head rent free, it is time for them to be evicted. It is time that we have to let go of that unforgiveness. Now watch this. Let's talk about what unforgiveness is not. Number one, forgiveness is not condoning what the person did to you. These are some of the reasons why people struggle forgiving. is because they're like, no, it makes it seem like it was okay. No, it was not okay. Forgiveness is not condoning what the person did to you. Many people hesitate to forgive because they feel as though the wrongdoer is getting away with the offense or that forgiveness will somehow condone the offender's choices. It doesn't. Instead, forgiving releases the wrongdoer from the debt he or she owes you and releases you from the bitterness. Let's just face it. Some of the people who borrowed money from you and knew all along they were never going to pay you back. And here you are saying to yourself, I want my money back. I want my money back. Give me my money. I'm here to let you know some of them, they're not going to pay you back. They're not going to pay you back. Oh, that burns our blood, doesn't it? But God says, release them from the dead. Just just you know what? Whatever. I'm going to leave that between you and God. I got to free my mind. I got to get this bitterness out because bitterness can cause even cancer and everything else in between. And so it's very important that we learn to let go of that bitterness. Now, forgiveness is not, I'm so sorry that it's up there like that. I had no idea that, you know, I didn't know the alignment, but forgiveness is not immediately trusting the offender again. Forgiveness is not immediately trusting the offender again. This is very important. Take a look. After a betrayal, trust is not automatic right of the is not the automatic right of the offender. Forgiveness does not mean you immediately allow the person back into your life or heart. It doesn't mean that. If someone is repentant, and willing to work on restoring the relationship, you might be able to trust him again eventually. However, sometimes those who wound us shouldn't be trusted again. Though forgiveness should not be contingent on the perpetrator's repentance, a truly repentant person doesn't demand forgiveness or misuse Bible verses in an attempt to make you feel guilty. Watch out for them. He humbly accepts, or she humbly accepts complete responsibility for the sin and the consequences for his actions. If you don't know about that, read Psalm 51, which may include giving you time to see evidence of his trustworthiness. All right? We're talking about what forgiveness is not. Lastly, forgiveness is not relieving the person of responsibility. It's not necessarily relieving the person of responsibility. Take a look. A person shouldn't be off the hook from his or her responsibilities just because you choose to forgive. Now, again, we talked about the brother who might have stole your money. He took your money. You've been asking him, give him my money, give him my money. They have made it very clear. I'm not going to give it or whatever. There does come a point in time. You got to say, you know what? That's it. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm not going to pursue you anymore on this. If you ever think to give, give me my money back, it'll be appreciated, but I'm not going to come to you anymore. I'm not going to hold you accountable to this. It is what it is. But there are some people, there are some people that they should not be relieved from their accountability. So look at the scenario here. A person shouldn't be off the hook from his or her responsibilities just because you choose to forgive. For example, a wife may be forgiven for placing the family in financial ruin with debt, but she should still be responsible for paying off the debt. 
A former husband may be forgiven for destroying his marriage with an affair, but he still should pay child support to his former wife. You can't just walk away and say, well, they forgive me, so whew, all right, let's just move on to another phase of life. No, you can't do that. You need to follow through on your responsibilities. You cause ruin, you must do what you can to repair that ruin. Forgiveness doesn't eradicate responsibility. It's not unloving to hold someone accountable. Often, accountability is the most loving thing you can do because it could lead to repentance. So let's make sure we understand clear as day what forgiveness is not. But now let's talk about what forgiveness is, my brother. Let's talk about it. Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 5. Let's go back to our scripture reading, Luke chapter 5. In Luke, the fifth chapter, the Bible makes it very clear that, number one, it's going to help us kind of know what forgiveness is. So we're going to look more carefully now at this power of the Lord. We already read verse 17, but we'll do it again for edification's sake, and then we'll go ahead and go further all the way, as you can see, to verse 25. Now, because it's a lot of verses, let me do 17, you'll do 18. I'll do 19, you'll do 20, and we'll take it down to 25. Is that all right? All right, let's do it. Luke 5, 17, I'll read. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the, tit, through the tilling, tiling with his couch into the mist before Jesus. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. Verse 25, and immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Now, you just saw in verse 17, it said the power of the Lord was present to heal. The only time you see the word power come back up again is verse 24. Verse 24 specifies what that power was that was present to heal. What did he say? That you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to do what? Forgive sins. He says, rise up. Did you know forgiving, did you know being forgiven for your sins and forgiving others of their sins has power to heal you? According to the writing of the great physician. Literally, you and I being forgiven of our sins and then forgiving others of the sins that they have committed against us, according to the word of the living God, there's power to bring healing to us. I think about how many of my brothers and sisters are suffering with so much hypertension. And you better believe stress and unforgiveness will heighten your blood pressure. I think about how many of us are battling with the pandemic, not of covid but of diabetes type 2. Stress can cause insulin resistance to up, up to almost 30%. Insulin resistance. Cancer? Brothers and sisters, you have something called T cells that are the wonderful fighters against a lot of those cancerous cells that develops in yours and my body on a daily basis. But do you know that chronic stress 
can cause the immune system to more so prioritize keeping those cortisol levels down, but it can also cause your immune system to become weakened so that it is not able to fight off certain infections and other things that can ultimately affect the body. And if we're not careful, it can bring on sickness and disease, and it can allow even some of those cancer cells already within us to start to develop and to become malignant. God wants you to understand that forgive, there's real healing power in forgiveness. Forgiving people of the sins they committed against you and forgiving and being forgiven for the sins that we committed against God. I want to talk about this. When we look at the subject of forgiveness, forgive, the word forgive, the root word for forgive, that root word is a Latin word called perdonare, which is where we get pardoned from, right? It, it means to give completely without reservation. Notice that. To forgive, the Latin word perdonare means to forgive completely or to give completely without reservation. That perdonare is also the source of our English word pardon. The result is what's called forgifen, appeared in Old English, meaning to give up allow as well as to give in marriage this is just we're just looking at the word right now okay one clue to understanding forgiveness is to look at the origins of the word the word forgive comes from an old english word forgifen which is itself made up of two words gaifen meaning give and for meaning completely so the word forgifen conveys the sense of giving completely now do you remember how we started our message off talking about i forgive you but i'll never Like I said, there's a common sense side. You don't forget trauma. You don't forget what happened to you. You don't just forget an event that changed the trajectory of your life. You don't forget that. But what do you do with the remembering of it? That's what's key. In other words, one of the greatest signs of one who is healed from their trauma is that when they remember the, tra the traumatic event, rather than focusing on what someone did to us, we focus more on what God did for us. That's what changes everything. That's the sign of someone healed from their trauma. They don't look at it the same way. They remember it, but they don't look at it the same way. They see the hand of God through that crisis that they went through. And look at what God produced now in me and in you as a result of that crisis we went through. That's what's going on in the memories hall now rather than that evil, dirty, rotten, terrible demon. I hope they go to, and you can finish that sentence. You understand that? Rather than going there, our mind goes in a completely different place. Why? Because when we gave them forgiveness, we gave it to them completely. We didn't reserve anymore. We're not talking about let them back in your life immediately and all that other stuff. Listen, when God forgives us, does, if we confess our sins, listen carefully to what I'm about to say. If we confess our sins, is God faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? So if he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, then what are we? righteous so here's the question why is it that he doesn't just immediately take us to heaven we're clean why doesn't he take us to heaven yet because he knows that there's more involved than just redeeming a soul it's important that the soul is restored when the soul is restored back into the original image of God God says now I can trust you in my house but until my image is restored back in mankind, even though I forgave you, I know my image is not restored in you yet. Therefore, I can't bring you in my house right now. We got to do some restoration work. Now, that's why we're not in heaven yet, because God is still restoring us, though we might be truly forgiven. So it is with those who have offended us. We can forgive them, but that doesn't mean the relationship is immediately restored. They have to show proof that they are changed. Doesn't that make sense? You can forgive the rapist, but you don't, you don't bring the rapist back in your house to have dinner. You understand that? That person needs to give fruit. He, they need to bring forth fruit that is meat for repentance. They need to show that you are a different person. Now, these things have happened, okay? 
There's a story of, a, uh, I think it was in uh, one part of Africa, I forget the part of Africa, where a whole mob just came into church. Said, where's the pastor? And the church is in fear and everything. And they said, where's the pastor? Where's the pastor? The mob had a bunch of machetes. The pastor eventually breaks through the crowd, comes forward. He says, I am the pastor. Young man comes to him, wham, throws his machete right in the center of his forehead. Kills him. Then they start cutting up all the people inside of the place trying to kill them, one of which was that pastor's wife. She lived. That boy got caught amongst, uh, along with the other rebels. The boy got caught, went to prison. The wife, of course, battled with hatred in her heart, but she was a converted woman. So she prayed and she asked God to take this unforgiveness and this hatred out of her heart. God did it. She ended up going to that prison because he was a young boy. He was a young, impressionable boy. She ended up going to that prison. This is a true story. She went to the prison. She ministered to the boy. Taught him of Jesus. Called him to surrender his heart to Christ. You know what that young boy did? He accepted Jesus. He became a Christian. Some years later, he was let out of that prison. Homeless and nowhere to go. A lady shows up and a lady says, I would like to adopt this boy and bring him into my house and I will receive him as my son. And the strangest part of it all, that lady was the wife of the husband whom he murdered. The power of forgiveness brings, it can bring us to a place of restoration but it's after the evidence of conversion. Are you following that? You get that? Okay. So this is what God is showing us here is that when we truly forgive, it's giving completely. It's not, I give, but I'm going to reserve a little hatred for you. I forgive, but I'm going to reserve a little bit of this bitterness and, and, and all these other things. God says it might be human to do that, but it's not divine. God says, that's not how I forgive. And you and I need to say, thank you, Jesus, for that. Can you imagine Jesus saying, I forgive you, but I'm going to reserve some of my love. I'm going to reserve some anger and bitterness towards you. I just want you to imagine, because remember, the manner and the extent that you and I forgive others is the manner and the extent we give Jesus license to do towards us. So the Bible says it like this in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. Now watch in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the Bible puts the language like this. It says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when he forgives us of our sins, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, we become made the righteousness of God in him. Now what we're supposed to do is abide in him every day so we can stay righteous. Are you following that? This is how the plan of salvation works. Romans 3, 24, 25. Take a look at the text. It's beautiful. It says being justified freely by his grace, right? Then it says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation or mercy seat through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Every time God forgives you and I of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, he declares you to be righteous. Right there. He inputs his righteousness upon you. Now, he says, now I need you to learn to die daily so he imparts his righteousness to us day by day, day by day, and we become more and more like him, A-I-E, restored until eventually God says the work is complete. Now I see a perfect reflection of myself and Dwayne. Now I can finish my work in the sanctuary, close it all up, and now I can bring my son home. This is what Jesus is doing right now. So, summary. Forgiveness is not only pardoning someone for the wrongs they've done, but also giving them a token which shows a willingness for reconciliation, though it may not be immediate. 
It requires God to do this. You follow that? It requires God to do this. You need, you need God in your heart to do this. You need his help. Don't try to do this on your own. You need the Lord's help. Now, let's go a little further on this. Three categories of forgiveness. I can't wait to go into this with you. Number one, forgiving yourself. Number two, forgiving those who have offended you. Number three, to know you are truly forgiven. We got to go through these three steps. Forgiving yourself, forgiving those who have offended you, and to know you are truly forgiven. Let's go break it down. Y'all ready for this? Let's go into study. Let's talk about forgiving yourself. How many of you ever heard this before? You need to forgive yourself. You know, you failed, you did some wrong things, you kind of beat yourself up about it, you, you're overwhelmed with guilt, right? You feel like, man, I messed up, I can't believe I did that. You know, you kind of do this self-mutilation, right? So we talk about forgive ourselves. There are organizations that talk about self-forgiveness, forgiving yourself. And here's what it says. What is self-forgiveness and why is it important to your mental health? So here's what they found. Choosing to forgive yourself doesn't mean you are weak. It does not mean you are off the hook for what happened. It does not mean you tolerate behaviors that occurred. Forgiveness, whether of someone else or yourself, means you accept actions and behaviors that occurred while willing to move forward. You are eager to move on, knowing you can't change what happened. Forgiving yourself means letting go of the feelings and emotions associated with what went wrong. You let go of any resentment or anger. It may be easier to do this when forgiving others, but many find it hard to do this for themselves. Notice that. It is easier to do this for others, but it's harder to do this for ourselves. Now watch this. I'm going to show you why it's so hard for us to do this for ourselves. Have any of you ever heard somebody say that? I'm trying to forgive myself, but it seems so hard. Anybody ever heard that before or whatever? All right. Maybe you tried it yourself, right? Oh, Lord, I just, I'm struggling with this. Well, look at this. Signs that you might be suffering from guilt. These are typical signs of one who is suffering from guilt. If you're typically going through two, three, or more, then chances are this, this is a very serious issue. Um, anxiety, crying a lot, insomnia, rumination. Rumination is a big one. You go to bed at 9 o'clock, but you go to sleep at midnight. You understand that? 9 o'clock, you go to bed, but you don't go to sleep till midnight because between 9 and 12, you're ruminating. You go to bed and you're like, hold up, did that brother say that to me? I can't believe he said that. Man, if I would have caught that thing early, I would have... Like, literally, that's what's happening. It's called ruminating. You're ruminating. You're in bed, and you're going through your day like, you know, I can't believe this. You know what? I'm going to go back to that store tomorrow. I'm going to tell that sister what I think about what she said. It's like, that's ruminating, right? So a lot of people go through this. Worry, upset stomach, because there's a connection between the brain and the gut, right? Um, muscle tension, regret, all of this stuff. These are signs that we're battling with some nasty guilt. Now, watch this. Here goes this theory of forgiving yourself and what we need to do. But the truth is, people really struggle with it. Now, check this, statist this uh, statistic out in the U.S. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults in the United States, 18 and older. Your, st your statistics in British Columbia are, are almost exactly the same. I just finished teaching this in Chilliwack last week. They're almost exactly the same. Now watch. It says, or 18.1% of the population every year. So even though self-forgiveness is being promoted and encouraged, the anxiety levels and the guilt levels are still going higher and higher and higher and higher. Here's the question. Why? Here's the answer. Self-forgiveness is not having much success. You know why? Because I will give you all the money you desire right now if you find one verse in the Bible where God tells you to forgive yourself. I will cut you a Canadian check for $1,000 if you can find one verse in the Bible where God calls you to forgive yourself. Self-forgiveness sounds good, but it's unbiblical. 
Watch. The Bible says in Acts 5 and verse 31, watch carefully what the verse says. It says, God exalted him. That's talking about Jesus. The him is Jesus. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give, to give repentance to Israel and what else? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is birthed and resides in the heart of God. And then God gives that to humanity. You and I do not have innately the ability to forgive others and certainly not to forgive ourselves. It is a gift that comes from the heart of God. Now watch. In Ephesians 4 and verse 32, the text is too clear. It says, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has done what? Forgiven you. You see, God is not calling you to forgive yourself because he knows that's an impossibility. But what God does say is he says, receive by faith the forgiveness I give you. That's the mind of God. God says you don't need to waste your time trying to forgive yourself. That's a God thing. God says, accept the forgiveness that I give to you. Believe that I've washed you. Believe that I've cleansed you. Believe that I've purified you. Believe that I've justified you. That's what God says. He's not calling you to forgive yourself. He's calling you to accept the forgiveness he gives you. And so again, when we look at the summary, we are not called to forgive ourselves. It sounds good in the world of psychology, but it's not biblical. We're not called to forgive ourselves. What are we called to do? Instead, we accept by faith the forgiveness God has given to us through the cross of Calvary and by our confession of our sins. Stop trying to forgive yourself. Accept the forgiveness. Go to God, confess your sins, all of them, with specificity. Lord, I lied, I cheated on my husband, I did this, I did that. Tell God what you did. Confess your sin, take ownership, and then say, have mercy upon me, O God. Hear my cry, O Lord, and attend unto my prayer. Please forgive me. And then God says, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If God forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, what remains for you to forgive yourself? Be careful of some of these strange psychology teachings. Not everything from Sigmund Freud's mind is pure. Are there any psych majors in the room? Not everything that's taught in the world of psychology is legit. There's some lies mixed with the truth. And forgiving yourself is not heaven's prescription. God says, accept the forgiveness I give you. It's way more power in it. Way more power in it. If you understand what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Let's go to those who have offended you. This is the tough one. Right? That might be an uncle who touched you. When he was your uncle, he should have never did that. That might be a father who was abusive. That might be a mother who was neglectful. That might be a so-called friend who took advantage of you. People who did, again, some real demonic foul stuff. How do we forgive them like God forgives them? And again, some of them have not even apologized. How do we do it? God has an answer. Three things to remember when struggling to forgive others. Three things to remember. Number one, remember they do not truly know what they are doing. You know, can you imagine Pilate goes to the people and says, all right. Pilate says, find the dirtiest, nastiest criminal we could find. Somebody under the prison. So they say, hey, we got a guy. His name is Barabbas. He said, all right, let's get him. Because Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. Pilate knew it. So he finds the dirtiest, nastiest example of a human being. And he says, let's use this brother. He brings out Barabbas, and then he brings out the lowly Jesus. He says, which one do y'all want me to condemn? He's hoping. Come on, y'all, say Barabbas. But what do they say? 
Jesus. Condemn? No. First, who do you want me to free? Free Barabbas. And they was like, well, then what do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Then he said, why? What did he do wrong? They, ch- they cried out the more. Crucify him. So they're very clear in their language. Crucify him. Then Pilate says, this is crazy. I don't believe this. Pilate says, I got to do what they say because I'm scared and I need to please the people. So what does Pilate do? Pilate brings this bowl out or has a servant bring the bowl out. And Pilate goes, all right. Whoosh. He says, I wash my hands from this just man, this innocent man, not realizing he condemned himself. That will come up against him in the second resurrection. Now, when Pilate said, I am free of this innocent man, the people very intelligibly said, that's all right, Pilate. His blood be not only on us, but on our children whom he healed and sat on his lap. Are you following? They sounded like they knew exactly what he was saying. The priest, inspired by demons, was going all through the crowd. Cry out, crucify him. Cry out, crucify him. Ask for crucifixion. And these are people that Jesus healed. These are people that Jesus blessed. These are people that Jesus fed. So here it is that they're doing all of this stuff. And then the time finally comes where Jesus is on the cross and everything. He's listening to them. He's hearing everything they say. Hey, you were able to save others. Save yourself. And Jesus says words that some of us would really struggle to believe were it not from the lips of Jesus. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They actually don't know what they're doing. We have to understand that as real as God is, is as real as the devil is. And the same way that God can guide and control a mind for good, the devil can control and possess a mind for evil. And sometimes there are people around us that are controlled, some momentarily, some completely, by demons. Some people are controlled by devils. And as a result of that, they say what their father wants. Remember what Jesus said that in John 8, 44? You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. He didn't say you might do. He said the lust of your father, you will do. He's your daddy. You do what your daddy says. You don't have the power to resist your daddy. But Jesus came to free us from our foul daddy and to introduce us to a real heavenly father. And so it is that the first way that we, rem- that we can forgive others is, number one, please, just remember, as much as it looks like they knew what they were doing, because I, I get it, that's why I walked you through the story. It looks like they know what they're doing. They really don't know what they're doing. They are under the power of a demon. What's principle number two? Principle number two Remember, according to Romans 5 and verse 10, you and I were once God's enemy. Romans 5 and verse 10 says, when we were enemies, God reconciled us by the death of his son. We were God's enemies. I want to introduce you to somebody. How many of you have ever seen that woman's face before? Anybody ever seen her face before? She made news in America. Her name was Carla Faye Tucker. Carla Faye Tucker. Does that ring a bell to anybody? All right. Carla Faye Tucker. She was born November 18, 1959. She died by execution February 3rd, 1998. Carla was a thief. Carla was a drug addict. And Carla decided to rob a house one night. And when she robbed the house, she robbed the house and she was spoiling the person's goods along with another partner. And it got to a certain point in the house where Carla uh, went into the bedroom and she saw like a lump under covers. She looked at the lump and she saw that it was a person. She pulls the covers off and it's this woman. So she starts fighting this woman and wrestling her to the ground. Carla eventually sees a pickaxe and she grabs the pickaxe and then she rams it into the woman. And she rams it into the woman, not once, not twice, but several times. It says, Tucker proceeded to hit Thornton. That was the lady's last name, Deborah Thornton. Tucker proceeded to hit Thornton repeatedly with the pickaxe and then embedded the axe in her heart. That's how she killed her. The cops show up. Tucker gets caught. When they interviewed Carla Faye Tucker... They asked her, why did you do this? What was going on in your mind? And all these other things. Now, let's see here. Man, I hardly see any children. 
I don't know if I should speak in code, so I'll speak in code nevertheless, because you never know. I don't know who's listening or whatever. I'll speak in code. There is an experience that God created that belongs only between a husband and a wife. Are we all on the same page? Y'all know what I'm talking about? We good? Okay. In that experience that God created only for husband and wives, there is a height in that experience that begins with the letter O. Are y'all still tracking with me on that? You understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Is there anybody who does not know what I'm saying? All right. So you know what I'm saying. Okay. Carla Faye Tucker said this. Tucker would later tell people and testify that she experienced intense multiple O's with every blow of the pickaxe. I wish you all could see your faces because you're making the same face I made when I read that. I read that and I said to myself, that's sick. Those are the words that just came out of my mouth. I said, that's sick. And I remember I was by myself when I was watching this program, watching the news report. Um, And I was like, that's sick, that's sick, that's so crazy. And I believe God speaks to our conscience. I believe that. So here I am pacing throughout my living room. That is so sick. I can't believe that somebody could have so much pleasure while killing an innocent person. And it was like I hear this voice in my conscience. Yep. It's pretty sick to have so much pleasure while killing an innocent person. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, that is madness. I mean, I've gotten to some fights and stuff like that, Lord, but I would never do anything like that. That's ridiculous. And God is like, yep, it's pretty ridiculous for somebody to have so much pleasure while killing an innocent person. And I'm like, yeah, Lord, what is wrong with that woman? I can't imagine this. And God is like, yep, unimaginable. For someone to have so much pleasure while murdering an innocent person. And then God brought to my attention, my son was innocent. He came to this world only to bless you. But you loved your sin so much that you didn't just commit your sin, you had pleasure when you did it. And God was saying, son, you had pleasure. Not understanding Hebrews 6 and verse 6 says, every time we sin, we crucify the son of God afresh and bring him to an open shame. And I remember the most solemn news that God ever told me. Dwayne, you are Carla Faye Tucker. Congregation here in Surrey, I have bad news for you. You are Carla Faye Tucker. Not for the sins you didn't know, but for the sins you did know. For the things you know. You know God said this is wrong. You're not stupid. You know God said it's wrong. You know God and his word said it is a sin. But you did it anyhow. Why? Because it brought so much pleasure in the moment. And God says, what makes you different? God says, I'll tell you what makes it different. God didn't only show me that I was Carla Faye Tucker family. God showed me that I was worse. You see, she only did it to one woman. She murdered once. But every time we repeatedly go back to the stuff we want to do, we crucify the Son of God afresh. We're not just murderers, we're serial killers. Repeat murder. It's a solemn thing to think about that. Do you you look at your life and your sins the way we just 
made that face about her. When we say, oh, oh, that's so terrible. Do we have that response when we do what we want to do in the name of pleasure, in the name of fun? I believe with all of my heart, one of the biggest problems we have with forgiving other people is we forget how wretched we are. We think because we now make six figures versus five or seven figures versus six, because we have now nice looks, nice hair, nice car, nice lifestyle, because we've accomplished some things, maybe we even got to the point that we're now elders or leaders in the church and we preach and teach and do all sorts of good stuff. We we begin to forget from where we came from. Not realizing the wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked sinners we were. And now we have the nerve to go around judging other folks the way some of us do. You know one of the reasons why Paul was so powerful in his ministry? When you read in Galatians and other places in the Bible? Because Paul always remembered where he came from. He never forgot what God delivered him from. But here's the good news, family. I'm not just that Carla Faye Tucker. You're not just that Carla Faye Tucker. But thank the Lord, we can be this Carla Faye Tucker. You see, that's her too. While Carla was in prison, she heard the story of the gospel. She gave her heart to Christ. She experienced a very real and a very dynamic, true conversion. And as a result of her experiencing this real, dynamic, true conversion, Carla began to preach and to teach and to share the gospel in the prison with the warden and with the officers and with her fellow inmates. And she became a soul winner for the Lord and and such a powerful, mighty force for God that when it got close to her execution date, these people came to her rescue. Among those who appealed to the state of Texas on her behalf were Bakr Wali Nadaye, the United Nations Commissioner on Sunday and arbitrary executions, the World Council of Churches, Pope John Paul II, Italian Prime Minister Romano Prodi, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives Newt Gingrich, televangelist Pat Robertson, and probably most miraculous of all, and Ronald Carlson, the brother of Tucker's murder victim, Debbie Thornton. They all said, please don't kill her. She's a different person. You see, we are a mess, and our greatest healing comes from accepting that we are a mess. But God came to clean up and save a mess, and God did that with her. When she went on the gurney on the day of her execution, all she had was blessings for everybody. She says, I pray for the warden of this prison facility. I pray for the officers. I pray for my inmates. She says, God bless you all. I want to see you in heaven. And she died in absolute peace on that gurney because Christ made her free. Let's make sure that while, yes, it is true that we might be the black and white Carla Faye Tucker family, I'm thankful we can move to the other side and become the color version. Please, for Christ's sake, become the color version. Don't keep knowing that this stuff is breaking the heart of God and just live in it. Come to Jesus while he is still stretching out his arms. But I promise you, when you remember you were once God's enemy, you will deal with people differently, guaranteed. The reason we're so rough on people is because we forgot where we came from but for the grace of God. Lastly, whoops, lastly, remember the joy it brings to others and gives to you. Forgiving is beautiful. I didn't get to introduce this, uh, uh, I I didn't get to introduce uh, my lovely wife to you all, but that's my wife right there. Can you say hi to everybody, honey? Just wave your hand real quick. Hey. (laughs) Hey. That's my bride from my side. Now, brothers and sisters, I I know two things. I know what it is to be forgiven if I do something wrong to my wife and then she forgives me. I know the joy that that brings. I know that there are times that my wife has done things to offend. Next Saturday, next Sabbath makes 27 years that we've been privileged to be together in holy matrimony. And there are times that in our marriage, my wife did things that offended me. 
and she needed my forgiveness. And I've seen the smile on her face when I would say, I forgive you. I forgive you. What I'm telling you is that there is a joy that comes to us. And there is a joy that we give to others when we choose to forgive and to be forgiven. I want you to remember that joy. The Bible says in Proverbs 11 and verse 25, the liberal soul shall be made fat and he that waters shall be watered also. I close out with these thoughts in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I understand we have bitterness. I understand it's still in our heart. I understand that there's still some offenses, but we must strive with God to let all of it be put away from our heart. It says, let all of this stuff be put away from our heart. And then God says, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Remember the forgiveness God gave to you. Now go, give that to others. Give that to others. The summary, when we struggle forgiving others, let us remember the cross. Remember the cross. The cross shows us how guilty we are before God. Yet, in spite of our sins, he's willing to forgive us. Therefore, we should forgive others as well as they are, in fact, lesser offenders. They're lesser offenders. When we compare what somebody did to us versus what we did to God, they're they're the lesser offenders. I want to leave you with this little video here. Um, I hope you all are ready. You let me know if the video can play. Can God forgive me? Just remember this. In Micah 7, God says he's cast our sea. He's cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Uh, The Mediterranean is the the deepest of what we know today. And, um, you know, it says the direction of the Mediterranean Sea relative to the Near East. This is the deepest area of, of the bed of water that mankind is aware of. And God says he's cast our sins all the way at the bottom of it. And there's a reason no man can get to the bottom of the sea. God says, no no person can uproot your sins. When God forgives you, he has taken your sins away from you. He has put it all the way down at the bottom where no man can pull it back up. So when God forgives you, that's what counts more than anything else, is that he has forgiven you. God says, for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy. You can come to him today. It says, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly, abundantly pardon. Last verse, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God says, don't come timidly, come boldly to my throne of grace, and I will help you. I leave you with this uh, little video. And this is the video of a true story, the Green River Killer. He killed over 70 women. He killed them very brutally. And uh, he's now at trial. He finally got caught. And I want you to see what happened. Whoa. Okay. Are y'all able to play it? You talk to me, family. Are Are you able to do it? It's the last slide. There it is. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It's okay. The bottom line is the Green River Killer was a a brutal murderer. He did some very terrible things to people. And the time finally came where he was in the jury, amongst before the jury and ready to be sentenced. And of course, they allowed the parents 
the relatives of all of those who died to give their final comments. The great majority of them came forward and said, we hope you go to hell, we hope you die, you don't deserve to live. They wished him pain and suffering and all the things that comes from the natural human heart. But then this gentleman comes forward and this gentleman looks at them and he says to the, says to the man, he says, Mr. Ridgway, he even calls him Mr. He said, Mr. Ridgway, there's a lot of people here that hate you. And he said, I'm not one of them. He says, you have made it difficult for me to, to do what I believe, which is to forgive you. And he said, Mr. Ridgway, you are forgiven. Now, you have to understand, when everybody else said, I hope you go to hell, literally, Mr. Ridgway's face, stone. They said, I hope you suffer. You were a mistake. They said every evil thing they could say. His face, stone. But when that father came to him and said, sir, you are forgiven. That was the first time he broke down crying. First time he broke down crying. There's so much power in forgiveness. And it took the grace of God to help that man do it. And it's going to take the grace of God to help you do it. And so my appeal is very simple. If you know, if you know that you've been coming to church, you've been doing your thing, but for some reason, there's been some area of bitterness still in the heart, someone who has offended you, someone who's, who's done you wrong. They maybe have not owned their wrongdoing and they just have kind of moved on with life. And it bothers you because you almost feel like, Lord, they're getting away with it. God says, don't worry. I will repay God says, every unrepentant soul will have to deal with me. And the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Nobody gets away with anything. But family, I'm wondering if there's somebody in this room, even if it's one person, because heaven rejoices even over one sinner that really, that really repents. Is there anybody in this room that says, you know what, I'll be honest with you. I've, I've had some bitterness in my heart. There's some people who've hurt me. There's a person who hurt me. It could be husband, it could be wife, it could be son or daughter, it could be mom or dad, it could be ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend, ex-husband, ex-wife. Who knows what it is? Co-workers, church members. If there's anybody in this room that can honestly say, I've been battling with forgiving some people. And I heard the voice of God today. And I just am asking Jesus to help me to finally, truly, and freely to forgive as he forgives. If there's even one person under the sound of my voice that says, yep, that's me, please remember me in prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. I know that this is not easy. Um, this is very difficult. And the reality is, is that we've been hurt. And I just want you to know that the first thing that God tells us to do, family, is let's get things right with you. I want to encourage you, get things right with you. I understand that there's some people we need to deal with. There's some people we probably need to call. There's some people we probably need to visit. And we need to finally put this thing to an end of this unforgiveness in our hearts. It's killing us. It's hurting us. It's not hurting them, it's hurting us. And so if there's any of you, I just want you to think, think in your heart. Who is it? Not only that I need to really establish true forgiveness, but please start with you. Is there anything that you have not confessed, you have not acknowledged, you need to get right between you and God? My recommendation is start there. And then from there, go ahead and seek to be reconciled to your brethren. And I understand that, you know, Matthew 5 does say, leave your gift at the altar and go to your brethren. But maybe you need to talk to God about some things first to be built up enough to go ahead and handle the unforgiving things that we need to deal with others. And so, my family, I just want to encourage you to know that Christ is with you. He loves you with an everlasting love. We are not alone in this battle. And I love the story of Christianity. It's the story of a holy God chasing sinners to ultimately receive us in his heart and to bring us into his kingdom. My hope and my prayer is that that power of the Lord that is present to heal, heals you. Why don't we all stand together? Let's close with a word of prayer. Let's thank God for what we have studied today. And may God have his way in our hearts. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, 
Lord, today you have brought your power down to this church and the power of the Lord is present to heal. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that has spoken to us. I pray, Holy Father, please let nothing, let no bird steal away the seed that has been planted in our hearts today. Help it to find deep root and may it grow and produce fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And may the forgiveness of Christ be received in our hearts and then given to those who need it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I? Ask besides, can I doubt his tender mercies, whom through life has been my guide, heavenly peace, divinest comfort.